When I came to MIT a year ago, I never thought I'd be living the lifestyle I do today. Naturally, when I'm around friends and family, I get a lot of questions asking what it's like to be here. So today, I'm going to give you a more or less average week in the life of an MIT student. We start off tame, maybe a little too much, but we keep our cool before kicking it up to high gear on Tuesday. Wednesdays and Thursdays are where the bulk of our assignments are due. This is also where most students experience their first mental breakdown of the week. <laughs> then, without fail, something like this will happen almost every week. You'd expect a wind down, some kind of reel in. Professors have a different story for us. During this week, we experience low sleep, incredible amounts of caffeine intake, skipped meals, and often nonstop work for hours. So it's natural that we take Saturday off, regardless of what we choose to do. And then there's Sunday. Who doesn't love Sundays? Anxiety-filled regret <laughs> fills and tops off our week. Six months ago, I decided to leave MIT to start a company and join corporate America. Oh, boy. <laughs> this is what happened to me. <laughs> but why do we think this is normal? For the last decade, high-stress lifestyles have been prioritized at the expense of personal well-being, leading to exhausted bodies and brains. A half of American office workers are burnt out. A third experience chronic stress, anxiety, anger, and depression. Most of us don't even understand the gravity of the crisis we're in right now. 120,000 deaths, 190 billion in healthcare costs each year. The biggest problem? We can't even attack it because we still can't track it. So I became interested in this brain health problem about six years ago now, when I watched a YouTube video of Israeli neuroscientist Henry Markram walking out onto a TED stage just like this one and telling the audience that in 10 years, he'd successfully simulate the entirety of the human brain. It'd help us understand diseases, behavior, longevity, and rewrite our understanding of reality and perception as we know it. Four years later, I got my chance to join the Human Brain Project. My work focused on using eye tracking as a diagnostic tool into disorders like Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, and dementia. We're not concerned with your vision, just the way your eyes moved. So me, myself, I can't see past two feet without my glasses on, but I'd say I have a generally healthy brain. During this time, we built a short test that's not only able to identify patterns like these, but use them to build and decode complex models of cognition. I got to work with scientists during a time we're now calling the golden age of neuroscience research, where we finally have the tools and technology necessary to understand what's going on inside our heads. Presenting at the Human Brain Project taught me a really important lesson. For far too long, we've been taking a reactive approach to neuroscience instead of a proactive one, researching diseases and disorders instead of understanding what we need to do for ourselves every day. The solution to the burnout crisis, it starts here. And so I started studying it. The first thing I learned, we know alarmingly little about the human brain. Newsflash, not everyone needs eight hours of sleep. Not everyone should be eating three meals a day. And as much as it surprises you, not all of you have self-diagnosed ADHD. <laughs> For the last year, I've been combing research, figuring out how we can cut these misconceptions we have with brain health. Today, I'm going to be discussing the four basic building blocks of a healthy mind. The first is sleep. Getting less than your specific required amount of sleep can lead to a 15% increase in mortality. So sleep more, right? Wrong. Oversleeping lends itself to a 30% increase in mortality, and not in pretty ways either. Cardiovascular disease, obesity, trauma, and a whole host of mental illnesses claim millions of life years lost. So how much should we sleep? There's really no golden number. Some people need seven hours. Some people need nine. Some have the low sleep gene that allows them to do four a night with seemingly no consequences. And while it is important to get a lot of sleep, it's much more important to consider what's going on during your individual sleep stages. All of your sleep stages are important, but REM is particularly interesting to us because of the way we regulate emotions. 
During our 90-minute sleep cycles, REM is unique in that it has a lack of neurotransmitter norepinephrine and a release of acetylcholine. This unique combination means that our brains don't feel fear or anxiety in the same way. You don't need to vent to friends because the right sleep is literally therapy, and it's free too. Another important stage of sleep is slow wave sleep, not just because of the effects it has on our memory, but because of what it does to our glymphatic system, activating and encouraging the cerebrospinal fluid in our body to literally brainwash toxins out. Activating this system is different from person to person again. Some people might take a hot shower before they go to sleep, and that encourages that activation. Others need a cocktail of supplements. Our brain is naturally good at dictating how much time we spend in each of these states, but what current advice evades is the fact that it's not about more sleep, it's about better sleep. And that's different for each one of us. The second basic building block is focus. For a while, we thought focus was an output of cognition. Have a healthy brain, and you'll focus better, which is true enough. But what we didn't understand about focus came when we were able to use quantitative EEG to understand electrical activity in the brain when we decided to deliberately defocus, like in meditation. What you're seeing above is called whole brain synchronization. After just 25 minutes of meditation, the corpus callosum, which connects the two radically different hemispheres of our brain, becomes extremely stimulated, making it easier to organize thoughts and communication and improving your entire cognitive toolkit. You don't need to meditate for this either. Studies show that just focusing your attention on the task you're doing drastically improves your current happiness levels. But it's hard in a world with so many distractions. Thankfully, as humans, we can enter what's called a flow state. Flow is this altered state of consciousness that occurs that seems like everything but the task you're focusing on recedes into the background. Entering a flow state requires deliberate focus, but staying in a flow state requires you to deliberately defocus to make sure your brain doesn't burn out. During flow, creativity and learning are amplified. In some studies, up to 500%. Flow works best when the challenge slightly exceeds our skill set. That brings us to our third building block, learning. Continuing to challenge your brain and learn new things activates neuroplasticity, forming new synaptic connections. As young kids, or at a young age, our brains are incredibly plastic. It's why it's so much easier to learn a language, or why little kids seem to remember every damn promise you've made them. <laughs> when we grow older, we lose this ability. So it's important to keep our gears turning. Challenging your body also encourages and activates neuroplasticity. When we exercise regularly, we express what's called brain-derived neurotrophic factors, or the BDN, BDNF gene, essentially a recipe for preserving and growing neurons. Doing this regularly means that exercise can help protect, grow, and enhance your brain in the same way it does to your muscles. The last building block is social interaction. Brain scans have showed us that when we're around people that we love, people that we care about, the same regions of the brain are heightened that are associated with rational thought and emotion. You don't need antidepressants, you need gratitude. It's not just people, it's experiences and activities you interact with too. The military did a study testing surf therapy, against, an extreme flow activity, against talk therapy. And in a two-month study, surf therapy outperformed talk therapy and PTSD treatment in nearly every soldier they tested. During social interactions and activity interactions, the intense cocktail of neurochemicals in our brain is enough to push trauma to the side. And so eventually, we might see doctors prescribing experiences instead of drugs. So the building blocks of a healthy mind. First, rest and recover frequently. Good sleep and non-sleep rest sit at the cornerstone of a healthy mind. Second, learn to find your flow state. There's 22 identified flow triggers, probably many more. Learn what works for your unique neurochemistry and biological rhythms. Third, challenge your mind and body to activate neuroplasticity, literally making you smarter. And fourth, find purpose in interaction, not just in the people you're surrounding yourselves with, but in the activities that you're engaging in. Purpose motivates, purpose pushes the motivation that energizes daily life. I wish I could give you a clear-cut plan on how to keep a healthy mind. But unfortunately, or I guess fortunately, all of our brains are radically different. 
All you can do is find your own frequency. I'm really lucky to have a chance to work on this right now. About six months ago, I left MIT to start Ocular Health. It's a translation of the research that we did with eye tracking and sleep health to give people actionable insights that not only guard, but enhance their brain. We hope that Oculo and our main metric, Burn, enable a new age of research and discovery that gleans insight into how the environment affects our brain. It's what made me stop out of MIT, and it's probably what will propel me into my next journey. As a 19-year-old, I've spent nearly a third of my human life obsessed with the brain. How to understand it, how to protect it, and how to change and improve it. When I got into college, my parents thought I knew everything. Where's the TV remote? Why is the Wi-Fi not working? What do you want to do with your life? Is medical school still on the table? When I started a company, nothing changed but the questions. How do I prevent Alzheimer's disease? Why do I keep on having migraines? How do I focus longer? I don't know. What I do know is it's up to each and every one of us to find our cognitive fingerprint, the way with which our brain feels and performs its best. Because a healthy brain is a happy life, and an unhealthy brain is an unhealthy one. Stop feeling wired just to survive the day. You'll fall behind. Because the beautiful thing about being humans, we're all built for peak performance. It's just about rewiring our nervous system to be our ally instead of our enemy. The work we're doing, it isn't designed to just bring you back to normal. No. We're building you a better brain. Thank you.